Obviously, this video is sponsored by Sweetwater. So if you see any of the cool recording gear or microphones, preamps, any of that stuff that you like, check the description. There are links down there below. Take you to Sweetwater and they will take care of you. Let's play some tennis. So for the first stop of our LA adventure, we are gonna be hanging out with my good friend, Steve Bellamy. Steve is the president of motion pictures and film at Kodak. Also, Steve is a collector, you could say a little bit obsessed with collecting historical guitars and one-of-a-kind guitar amps. He actually reached out to me about a year ago and asked me to help him put together a crazy studio to which I said, no way. And then we wound up doing it. So now it's been uh, six months or so, maybe a little bit more. And supposedly Steve has been using this studio every day to actually make music using uh, amazing studio players and all of his ridiculous gear, which by the way, you're not gonna believe some of the stuff that he has. It's fantastic. Another cool thing that we got to do in this video, courtesy of Steve, is borrow a Super 8 film camera and actually shoot some of the footage you're gonna see on film, which is very cool. So if you like that kind of stuff, hit the like button. I'm talking to you, Steven Spielberg. And it's also cool because I have not seen it since it has been complete. So this is gonna be a total reveal for me. If you guys haven't already, subscribe to the channel. We have a lot of new, really cool videos coming up while we're out here in Los Angeles. And uh, let's go check it out. Are you sure you're ready for this? Yeah, I'm, I'm pumped. Your baby, come to life, here we go. Whoa. Oh Aha. my God. The work of Andrew Masters. Tell me a little bit about where all this stuff came from and why you have it. <laughs> so, so this is my office. I have a very busy day job and it's also my creative outlet. So I write and record here and I, I use this. Um, I'm very connected to the entertainment industry and the music business and the movie business. And so I bring really inspiring people here to make art. It's got a laundry list of incredible people, artists that have been here and used it even though it's not very old. But so this is a museum. It's a musical instrument museum that chronicles a lot of the history of music. So these are Frank Sinatra's microphones. And here's him actually using a large condenser live. And wow. then here's all the amazing records. The, these, these microphones recorded the Beatles, Michael Jackson, Led Zeppelin, Van Halen, all kinds of amazing records. This is one of the coolest things that I own. Uh, this is Jimi Hendrix amp. It's the Atlas that has the distortion. So it's one of the very first amps that really had a true distortion circuit. Um, this is one of my favorite things in the world. Rudy Sarzo is one of my dearest friends who I just love. And he had a deal with PB to create a, a bass. This is the prototype. He got in kind of a war with them over where it was going to be made and the materials. Yeah. And uh, it sat under a bed for 15 years after he played it for five minutes and then he <laughs> came over and brought it to me. This is Ron Wood from the Rolling Stones Swope Holy GTO. Cow. Pretty cool. Uh, this is Noel Redding's, I believe the last guitar he ever played before he passed. This is the guitar that sort of a lot of people want to come use. This is John Lennon's 63 Duo Sonic. Oh my gosh. And it is, uh, <laughs> it's an amazing piece of music history. Wow. Uh, so I, I'm a big Fender devotee. Like if you said, are you Gibson Fender? I'm definitively Fender. Yeah. And uh, I have so much Fender stuff. But so this is a broadcaster. This is uh, okay. uh, fer serial number two, 286, but it has a maple plug instead of a walnut. So it's one of the very first ones ever made. Wow. You know, certainly Leo's hands are on that. And then if you scroll down here, this is a 1949 Fender Princeton. This is serial number 157. So this is just, wow. you know, absolutely kind of the uterus years of, of Fender. <laughs> this is Billy Joe Armstrong's 1960 Magnatone Zephyr. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, this is probably my favorite guitar amp. This whole wall here, you know, this, this, these two Gibsons are probably my favorite guitar amps of all time. Wow. Sort of like Phil X's, uh, the guitar amp that he just loves so much. So this one, I just can't even describe the growl that this thing has. Um, this is uh, Mike Ness's 1959 
uh, Tennessean, Miles Davis, the last guitar Walter Becker played, I believe, before he died. Oh my God. This is really interesting. So this is one of the very first Les Pauls. It's a 52 and it is, um, it's a flame body. You know, they were gold yeah. and they made the first few of flame and then they switched to non-flame. And so this one is, is one of the very, very first ones. Uh, Mike Ness's 55 Esquire, really cool. Uh, Daniel Donato's got a video that oh, was yeah. shot here yeah, yeah, yeah. that was, that's, a lot of people have watched. Uh, I'm a giant Marshall Crenshaw fan. This is his Epiphone coronet. So I have another one where he uh, uh, played it for me, but um, this one he recorded a bunch of his hits with. It, this is definitively a museum, but they're also, these are, this is a creative lab for people in the arts to come and use and make art. And ironically, you know, my day job is I'm the president of Kodak Motion Picture, and so many directors use this room because so many directors make musical art. Yeah. And so for sure, if you are making a movie on film, I'm saying, come on over, use it. Yeah. Um, this is Ron Woods from the Rolling Stones Vox AC30. Wow. Guns N' Roses. It's one of my favorite guitars. It's Walter Becker's Han prototype. George Benson's 1920 L1. This is a really famous guitar. Uh, we think it's a DiMarzio, but it was Walter Becker's. It's a one of a kind, and it's called the Oh No guitar. And then I'm so stupid and such a Mellencamp fan, I called it the Uh Huh guitar. <laughs> yeah, instead of the Oh No guitar. <laughs> um, this is one of John Hyatt's most prolific instruments. It was on the cover of three albums. His Silvertone oh, cool. 1446. Uh, here are some Fender prototypes. So these are only one in the world versions. Yeah. Um, this thing is just dreamy. It's it's a Rimini 12 string that was owned by the band Sunbolt. And they, rec they used it on the uh, Notes of the Blue record and tour. I don't do autograph things, but these are the Everly Brothers and these resided for like 40 or 50 years in an Indian gaming casino that after they played one night there. Yeah. And so I just acquired them. Um, Kenny Wayne Shepard uh, signed this and then he signed it to Steve, the second coolest person in the canyon. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming that that means he's the coolest and I am not, which would be de very definitive. Yeah, so there's all kinds of stuff, instruments owned by Van Halen, the, one of the Mary Kay prototypes, Mary Kay prototypes. This is cool. So this is Chris Shiplett from the Foo Fighters, uh, his Normandy. And so this was a guitar that you'd play and bounce lights off and yeah. blind the whole arena. So uh, again, I'm a big Fender historian. So in 1945, uh, Leo and Doc Kaufman made a company called K&F and they made lap steels. And these three are so primitive that this has magic marker for the fret fretboard. Um, <laughs> this has literally inaccurate measurements on the fretboard. It is silk screened, but you know, uh, fret number twelve is bigger than thirteen and eleven. Yeah. And so you know, this is really the the very beginning of rock and roll. Man. And uh, so then. And then you have all three. <laughs> so then those, <laughs> there are the instruments there. Man, that is so cool. Have you tried any of these? They're unbelievable. Like, I can't even describe how good this sounds. I've got video, I actually had Drake Bell from Josh and Drake the other day in here. He played this and it just sounds no way. amazing. If you think about it, Leo Fender made stuff that is still made exactly the same today. Like, that broadcaster is 1950 and 72 years later, it's exactly the same. I mean, wow. there's not anything materially different. Like, explain to me another product in America that's the same way. Yeah. Um, you go down here. So here is uh, Mike Campbell's Magnetone, I'm sorry, Hammertone Mando guitar. So wow. uh, it's a 12-string uh, a mandolin that's <laughs> tuned like a regular guitar. And electric. Yeah. That's so cool. Super cool. All of these kind of have some history. Ray LaMontagna, this is what Walter Becker used to use in hotels. This is from a band, The Three O'Clock. This is a Rickenbacker from 1930 that is literally like the first, like the very, very beginning. Wow. Uh, I said I was prolific. Um, these are all songs that 
oh my god i've written and there's more there this right here is the mixing board so on neil young's rust never sleeps obviously it was a half a live album and uh, so this mixing board was part of that that made Whoa. that record so this is the vocal booth and i purposely uh wanted this to be also the acoustic guitar room because i wanted a unique sound i wanted the sympathetic strings so yeah, you, you have a natural stain. reverb of all that and it really so this is a the banjo from the killers and when you put this in the room or take it out it's a completely different room sound i'm a giant fan of cowling's guitars so i got a, a lot of cowling's jumbos here mike campbell's Taylor 12 from Tom Petty. Here's another John Hyatt. I make a lot of guitars. So this is a guitar that I have my own little pet company, the Bellamy Guitar Company. And so this is a piccolo guitar that I made. Oh, that's a that's And really these cool. are all handmade by Danny Farrington. This is, it's, it's funny, Fender, you know, they get, they don't get a lot of kudos for acoustic guitars. Yeah. In 1980 and I think 81, they made these in Japan, and this is about the best sounding acoustic. But it's, it's just amazing. You said that's a jumbo what model? So it's a jumbo from Japan. I can't remember the model number, but okay. And the back here we have a uh, a tech area to where I'm going to change pickups. I'm in the middle of a building, some some guilds, and so I've got some tops. I just sourced these. These are. 50 years old from the Carlo Greca era. As I had mentioned earlier, uh, I was involved in putting this room together, but I haven't seen it with everything that you have set up. How has it been using it to make music? It's the greatest thing on earth. I mean, the greatest. First of all, the room, not through any of his intelligence, through all of my genius, uh, <laughs> uh, it sounds so good. So one thing that we did was yeah. we made the ceiling that uh, obviously is loaded with angles. Yeah. And that just serves the room so well. And then here, obviously you've got these two angles. And so that does a great job of, of not having parallel walls. And then the slat wall really does a good job acting as a diffuser. This nightmare of a ceiling design was Steve's idea <laughs> and actually turned out to be so wonderful because we wanted to get as much height out of the room as possible, but had to kind of work within limitations and it just came out to be such a beautiful result that, you know, unfortunately was Steve's idea. Yeah. So we, we were like uh, uh, two fighting boyfriend and girlfriends <laughs> and uh, he wanted to take the lazy way out and just put a, a ceiling on the bottom of these <laughs> joists. I'm like, no, no, I need the height. And so, I came up with this idea and then he was like, he was trying to shoot it down and he- uh, No, he, I, I wasn't trying to shoot yeah. it down. I was like, you know what? That's a good idea. I don't know how we're gonna do it. So that was a pretty, pretty good challenge for me to figure out how to do this, but. Yeah. Well, it turned out just amazing. I gotta just point out these, like the cabinets themselves yep. as a design. So, so these are made by David Lack, L-A-A-K-E. He's insanely talented at what he does. And so he made the desk, which is obviously very custom to fit the room. And then he made both of these cabinet walls. I wanted this to be something where, like I'm hardly a technical engineer, but I wanna be able to have an idea and create that moment. So this, you know, I have one drawer that's obviously way too long. Um, yes. And so this is, is the mic locker. I've got a few more, but this is, and I, I wanted it to feel like a guitar case. And um, have you I, ever have you ever tried any of the warm stuff? No, I haven't <laughs> tried any of the warm stuff. So um, <laughs> I am I'm a Fender devotee, and I'm a warm audio nut job. I, I just wow. I think when all is said and done, you're gonna have three people that will really be remembered as changing music. It'll be Leo Fender, it'll be Roger Lynn, and it will be Bryce the owner and founder of Warm Audio. I mean, he has, as we've kind of entered this Phineas world of music, where you know people are making it in their bedrooms and making stuff that sounds just as good as everything else, he has provided the tools that can do that at such a low cost. Like, this 47 sounds exactly like a 47. 
you know, so does the 67, so does that 87, that 251. I, I never thought that, that oh, an yeah. 8000 would work for what I do. Yeah. It is now my favorite microphone. Man, it's, man. these are so good. You could record easily, I don't know how much this costs, but it probably cost two or $300 at 414. You could record a whole album on this one mic and it would be radio ready. You know, if you have to buy stuff, that is the best company that I have dealt with. And outside of Fender, they're, they're just amazing. Now see if I can actually shut this door because sometimes it goes easy and then sometimes it, it takes like nine pushes, but. That's great. Um, oh and then gosh. this is a little messy, sorry, but this is pedals and I've got some pretty cool, anything you could want. And again, I've got like, that was Sean Lennon's and this played on Bruce Springsteen tours. It was Niles Lofgren's. So this is the drum room. And you know, I wanted a private room that was very soundproof. And so uh, this is Kenny Aronoff's drum set that he used on the, I think the Bon Jovi and the Mellencamp tours. And this room just sounds so good. So I've actually recorded drums in here and then I've recorded drums in the main room and they ironically sound a lot better in this room. Yeah. And, and everything is, uh, Andrew did a spectacular job of wiring. Well, no, Kim think that I had to wire a whole bunch of this. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what he you left get. You get subpar workers, man. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so the wiring, there's patch bays everywhere. It's really easy to, to plug and play. Probably the coolest thing in the room is this. When people make recording studios, it seems like they just focus on the audio. I really wanted to focus on the creativity. And so when you sit down to make, to make art, and you have this room, yeah. As opposed to this room, yeah. You know, or or this room, it's just a completely different feel. And so I worked with a company called Very Light, who is just—they're unbelievable. And uh, my hope is that every recording studio will call Very Light and and do this kind of a treatment because you just make better art. You know, if you're stuck on a bridge and you can't get through it, you go, yeah, let me see if I uh, make it red, what will happen? And it just unlocks creativity. And so that's really what this room is about, finding a way to foster creativity, whether it be writing a song or trying to sell a director film. It's uh, pretty much the same thing. I want to point out um, the first thing people like me think when they see lights like this is, well, that's going to make tons of noise. The, these lights are typically noisy and it's very quiet in here. Yeah, so here's the thing. So uh, I don't have all the lights plugged in. So these lights here and those lights there are the only ones that aren't very light. Oh yeah. And they are so noisy, it's, I can't use them. Yeah. And I did get very lights for this as well, but they ended up being too big. Yeah. And so I've got to trade those out. But um, yeah, there's no, very light. It's just, they're amazing. And they, uh, they just make great quality stuff. And it's more for concert touring and lighting movie sets and television shows and bigger things, but. It's really fun. Yeah. But I would for, have lots of fun. For an this. artist sitting there and picking up a guitar and playing with some faders and completely changing the mood, I, I've never seen a better kind of place to create or to foster creativity. You kind of have this as like a stage too, right? So this is a stage and I won't say all the artists that have played here, but we've had a lot of artists play literally right there. You know, some of the biggest artists in the world have sat there in front of yeah. 15 people here. This room like of late, Barnes Courtney recorded his new single here. You know, there's probably been 20 amazing artists that have been in here and either made art or play the guitars and yeah. And uh, it's well, just in the Hollywood, the word is kind of starting to get out. You know, some studios have stuff on hand, yeah. but nowhere has this kind of stuff on hand. Yeah, so you can sit in this room and you can take John Lennon's guitar, run it through Sean Lennon's pedal, plug it into Jimi Hendrix amp, plug it into Walter Becker's cabinet, mic it with Frank Sinatra's microphones, plug it in, run it through the Smashing Pumpkins outboard board gear, and you can run them through these Bass Boss monitors. These are, these are the Carbon 8 prototypes, and I believe they were in Kanye West's studio before mine, and they are just unbelievable. And then I've got them running through this, uh, this linear research amp, and it's just, it sounds fantastic. Um, also with very light, you know, this mixing board, that's just so much different than 
a light switch. Sure, yeah. So I'm running through a UA interface, which is just bulletproof and wonderful, and the people at UA are just amazing. But I'm very heavy, again, on warm audio. I mean, these 10, they're, they're called, their version are called the 273. You just can't find a better mic pre. You know, obviously, it's the 10, I, and I do have a pair of 1073s, which I rarely use. I always use the warm audio. I've got a, a bus comp from them, which is amazing. I've got a couple um, LA2As and a couple 1176s or whatever their names are. And then I've got a couple of Pultex or, or their version of warm audio's version of Pultex. But these things just cost so little money. I mean, they have really, this company has democratized the recording of music like nobody. Um, yeah, I've tried a couple of other things. You've, yeah, <laughs> I've seen. My favorite band in the world is the band Palais Royale, who are such artisans, so they made this briefcase. But wow. in this briefcase, this is from 1955. This is the Fender catalog, and it has the Esquire that is there. Wow. And then this is the Gibson catalog, and it has the Atlas, which is here. Oh, no way. Which is that you just got. the Jimi Hendrix one, yeah. Wow. And then this might be the coolest thing of all. So this is basically the, the address book starting in 1945, I believe, or 1946, that Dale Hyatt used to basically run Fender. And when he moved with Leo, he used this same book. Wow. And much like Leo, uh, it's still in fairly good condition, even though it was used for 30 or 40 years. So who would you have to rob to get something like that? Um, so the funny thing, I mean, I'm sure people will see this stuff and go, oh, what's he, a trust fund baby or something. Um, yeah. I actually am from very, very meager upbringings. And I have just done this a long time and I've learned how to find places where you can get neat stuff for for something that even a guy like me could afford. Yeah. I lots of times will be recording and we'll, we'll put lyrics up here and and uh, just you know a lot of screens here. Easy to communicate. Uh, we drink a lot of wine here. The best wine in the whole world, vegan bells. I don't know where you can buy it yet, but uh, <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> when we first met, one of the things you had mentioned is you had a lot of guitars and you wanted them in the studio, which I was like, how are we gonna, how are we gonna do this? Funny thing about this room or a cool thing, this is drywall down to 36 inches and then we have bass trapping all the way around the entire room. You suggested slat wall, which I, I was like, I don't know how that's gonna sound, but. <laughs> yeah, I think you're pretty definitive it, no on the slat wall. But it, you know, it turned out really amazing and it was kind of brilliant. I mean, it, I'm not trying, I promise I'm, <laughs> I don't wanna give you any more credit than I yeah. have to, but uh -huh. for the way that you use it, I can't believe how many guitars are in here. What, what kind of hangers were these again? Obviously, we, we, this is Southern California, we're in earthquake country, so yeah. I could only go with the best of the best of the best. And so this is, um, first of all, this is the, I think it's called the JMJ, Justin Melville Johnson, or I can't remember, but this is the best, it's brand new, and it is the best sounding bass ever. It's crazy how good this thing is, okay, short I'll scale. For you. Yeah, but so this, when the, when the weight of the instrument comes on, it locks in there. So if there is an earthquake, you know, these things are very safe. And this is, these are Hercules. And they're they're not that much more expensive than than regular hangers, but my God, they are amazing. Did they come with with this thing? Yeah. Attached? Yeah. It's fixed. Yeah. And that's just like a slat wall designed yeah. Hercules guitar? And you can get them that are with screws and not slat wall as well. Ah. Yeah, but amazing. What are some of the things you've done musically in here? How have you used it? So I, uh, I, I'm just a, I'm that guy. I write all the time. That's just my outlet. I create little things. I've created a fictitious rockabilly band. And so we've been recording a rockabilly set of songs. We've done 12 so far here. And I had a Slim Jim Phantom from the Stray Cats in here not too long ago drumming and Tony Canal from the band No Doubt. They were the rhythm section on this 
Rocket Blade project along with Kenny Arnoff and Rudy Sarzo. And I had the uh, horn players from the Eagles and the Who in here playing. And so all of these people came into this room and you tracked in the, everything in here? In the, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I did the vocals for that. I, I went to Sun Records in Memphis and sang the vocals first there. Oh, cool. I, I friends with some people that were good friends with Elvis and uh, sourced one of his original mics. And uh, oh. after it was a museum, we put up the regular RCA, brand new one, then we put up his, and then yep. from like 11 p.m. until 8 a.m., I sang <laughs> 10 songs. Wow. And then took that back here. We've done mo most everything here. Doug Pettibone is playing on it. There's so many great musicians in Los Angeles. Everything's working? <laughs> it, it literally couldn't be more perfect. It yeah. is just perfect. Um, this room is full 24-7. I had uh, Derek Wibley from Sum 41 here not too long ago. The band Honey County played right there. So many just amazing people have been in this room. One of the things that was really cool to me about putting this room together was trying to figure out all of the possible things you would want to do beforehand and then figure out how we're gonna wire between this room and the two booths. And there's even lines in the closet yeah, so we that's had, an ISO booth. Or yeah, the ISO booth. I had custom Redco panels made for behind the desk, so everything runs behind the desk. There's one behind this cab here, so you can, for the live yep. show, we can pipe lines over there, or if you're just tracking out here, you can run lines there. And then all the, the two booths, or the three booths, all connect back to here as well, so you can literally be anywhere in this place, and it all runs straight to these patch bays which I believe you have set everything up to kind of be in a permanent situation to the preamps that we, we picked. There's three definitive, completely isolated booths because that tech room is a booth with, with isolation and it's got all the electrical in there. This one, we did double drywall, we did green glue, cork floor, we threw everything at keeping that super soundproof. So, but you could record the Foo Fighters in here or some big band like that, no problem. Um, you've got enough isolation to do that. Regrets, if I had, I haven't hooked this <clears throat> PreSonus up yet, which I'm going to, uh, yeah. but in the meantime, I have my controls behind my thing and that's, I would, uh, I wish that was not the case. It's a bummer. Um, yeah, I wonder who suggested that. Well, you know, um, now that I'm thinking about it, um, you would love the Grace Designs M905 controller. Mm -hmm. This is this is a much cheaper one, but the ugly thing about it is you have all the cables going right here. Yeah. With the Grace, you can you basically have a, a unit kind of like your power amp over there, and everything runs to the back of it, and then it just has one cable that goes to the remote here and you can control every your headphones your yeah. speaker it's got it shows your levels it shows how loud you're listening it has to talk back in it okay gotta get that i i wanted a mic the only thing of warm audio like i've loved every single piece of product the arm i haven't got that to work well so i have a, a boom arm and i would love to be able to be sitting here and just oh, grab a mic and come yeah, here yeah and i just haven't got that to work i think those are more for people that are like sitting here and have it here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm a guy that you know needs the point of origin to be further, further, further away. And yeah, here's something that's pretty cool. So, um, a, a very dear friend of mine is the crazy talented uh, Shepherd Fairy. And so, for one of his art uh, openings, he had this Jimi Hendrix. And when I got the Jimi Hendrix amp. I acquired this from him, wow. and uh, so I'm trying to make sure that as long as that lives, that this wonderful piece of art stays with it. That's amazing. So is that, that's like, I'm not, I'm a total idiot when it comes yeah. to art. He painted on this? Yes, yeah. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah, that's that's the original Shep Fairy. Dude, that's crazy. I am uh, definitively not a hoarder of stuff. Uh, I am a person who's trying to be a shepherd of cool things and for the right people, make sure that they get in the right hands. And so for like the John Lennon guitar, I, I want people to make art with that. And I, I want people to be able to take 
tools from the past and use them to make art for the future. An interesting story. So I have, um, I have written probably 2,500 songs in my life, and I've never sat down and written a song tail to tail in one sitting. It's always, yeah. I'll write 60% of it or 30%. So I'd been telling every rock star in the world, hey, if you want to use the, the Duo Sonic, let me know, and I'll work something out where you can come here and be in the studio. And, uh, but I had never done it. And so one day I'm like, ah, oh, I, I should do that. And so I just sat down with a guitar, and 25 minutes later, I had a completed song. And the next day, I did it again, and the next day I did it again. So I was literally zero for 2,500, and then I was three for three using that one guitar. Which one was that again? It's the it's John Lennon's oh, yeah. Fender Duo Sonic. And um, so, I, I mean, I just believe that there is something that is above all of our pay grades about the connectivity between the past and the present, and. You know, the fact that John Lennon's got a lot of armpit DNA in there and mm. the guy was pretty talented at what he did. I think it rubs off on whoever holds that guitar. And the same with Noel Redding or Ron Wood or any of these. And the, the, all of the great vocals that have and Oh yeah. And uh, these were used for room mics as well. But God, the, the music that has gone through these two pieces of gear. And Those I, are I, fantastic microphones. They're insane. The, the crazy thing is, I can't use them with these mounts because they just, they pick up every noise. Um, and so I basically got, I got a couple of warm audio 251 mounts and I put those in them oh, and then nice. they're usable. But other than that, like, I mean, you inhale across the room and you hear it in the mic. Yeah, 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 that's cool. As I said earlier, I'm a Fender devotee and these are all one of a kind, very unique Fender guitars. So the bottom row is Strats and the top row is Tellys. I believe there were three Jason Isbell prototypes. This is one of them, and there's one on the other end, and I believe he has the third. <laughs> um, this is a guitar that Fender made for me. I obviously put my name in it. Wow. Uh, this and the Broadcaster are my two favorite guitars in the world. I just cannot tell you how much I love this instrument. Um, I love the channel-bound Fender necks, and so this is one that actually is reversed, the maples on the inside instead of the out. Whoa. Uh, I directed a movie a while back where an artist was a subject matter and um, he was commissioned to make some guitars in the middle of principal photography. And so uh, these three tellies were painted by uh, spray paint, sponges, and stencils. And they're Whoa. all the only ones in the world. Uh, same with this one. Um, this one has a unique bevel that does not come on most guitars. This is actually, I'm, I'm wrong, this is not a prototype. This is one I got from Tony Berg like a bazillion years ago that I think played on lots of records. Um, another proto, this is a sandblasted one. Wow. So just a regular strap, but it was sandblasted. And then this is the other Jason Isbell prototype. And there's an Ibanez, one from the 80s, I believe, that's cherry. And then I've got over here, this is pretty cool. So. Everybody probably associates this as a Fen or a Farrington Kramer. This is actually only a Farrington. So he made this after he left the Kramer relationship. And so this is a handmade Farrington guitar that looks like the Kramer. Yeah, you know, I was this. playing that earlier. That thing rocks. It's amazing. That is super yeah. cool. So with, I mean, I don't know how many guitars you have an insane amount. How do you yeah. like deal with security and stuff like that? So um, so the historical guitars and, and instruments, there's a couple of amps and there's the Sinatra microphones. Those actually don't live here. So okay. there is a, a very secure storage area that people that have these things all store them there and then a cartridge company will bring it here ah, if right. an artist or myself are gonna use them. Yeah. And um, That's crazy. So yeah, it's also in Southern California in the mountains, you have fire issue and yeah. there's yeah, all of kinds of things that could happen. So. Uh, I kind of look at, I am a shepherd of this piece of history. Yeah. And so unlike a museum where it just sits and you look at it, I, yeah. I want them to be played. Like I think John Lennon would love to have people use his instrument. Yeah. So I, I let Sean Mendez use the 
the John Lennon guitar and the broadcaster for his last record. Oh, cool. But then again, I literally drove to the studio yeah. and, uh, and hand delivered it and then drove it back. There's a lot of people that collect stuff like this that just put it in a vault. And so nobody gets to see it or nobody gets to play it. I'm yeah. at one end of the spectrum where I want tools of the past to be able to make art of the future. Yeah, you will hardly find two better playing instruments. And you know, people are so pumped on vintage guitars. The reality is these companies are making amazing guitars oh, yeah. today. Yeah. Like, that is such a great instrument. Wow. Yeah, yeah this is, cool. you'll hardly find a better guitar in the world than this. And again, this is, it's funny, you know, a guitar from 2000 and probably 10 and yeah. a guitar from 1950 are my two favorite guitars yeah. of all time. Yeah, yeah but that's this killer. is I, I've always associated lightness with sound quality. Whoa. And so this is just feather light. And uh, same with acoustics. Every acoustic guitar that I have that's really light sounds amazing. Hmm. And even some pretty, you know, expensive acoustic guitars that are heavier, I just don't think they sound as good. So this might be the best sounding amp that's close to it that I've ever heard in my life. I'm not joking. <laughs> it is a Kodak Brownie from like, I don't know, 1902. And uh, obviously not 1902, but very old. Yeah. And it's got a speaker here. You plug in there, it's battery powered. And I cannot even explain how good this sounds. What was that used for? Well, it was a camera. It was a... Uh, oh. Yeah. So. Uh, a 616, which I don't even know what that is, yeah. but I cannot describe how good this amp sounds. All right, well, if you guys want, I have a, a, a member section over on the website and we'll, we'll try that and we'll try a couple other fun things. Man, I can't believe we finally did, we finally did it. It was it, all you. It's just such a crazy journey. I came out here two times to work on this and then it's been six or so months since it's completed and uh, Gotta hand it to you. It's pretty, pretty damn cool. Yeah, the funny thing is he did not see it looking like this at all. Yeah. I mean, not even remotely close. Yeah. So thank you for letting me do a video here. And um, thanks for doing what you do. I'm gonna put links to your stuff okay. and down in the description if you guys wanna follow him and uh, check out all of the adventures that he goes on. He's friends with very cool people. We'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you again. Lots of fun. <laughs> Here, bring it. All right. <laughs> All right, bye. Cut. <laughs>